Oh, thank you very much to every one of you to still attending, you know, my talk today about meeting the new Euro 7 breakware particle emission standards. I really have to read it because it's awkward. Okay, this, my co-authors are Dr. Sadia Nozir and Paolo Abrantes, and we are working in the R&D department in Nitrex. Okay, um, it's a bit confusing with that many screens around me. So the motivation is, is quite obvious. You know, me, myself, I'm heading out of, of Europe, and of course you have this Euro 7 standard coming up. You heard it all already. So and um, even while the pros proposal now is propo postponed to uh, November, as you already heard, um, it's going to be effective as of 2025 or 2026, the latest. So there's something we have to do. And again, you know, you know this graphs, of course, yourself uh, as well already. You see basically how the particulate matter emissions are being reduced year after year. But you see there is this yellow line in the bottom. I don't know, this thing. And this thing represents basically the line of non-exhaust particulate emissions. And as you see, the exhaust uh, track basically is getting better and better. And anyhow, in 2035 or something, there won't be any internal combustion engines any longer. So we have only the orange line. And therefore, obviously, the European Commission is now tackling the orange line. So about 30% or more than 30% of this orange line is actually uh, caused by, by the braking system. And the Again, if we compare, let's say, battery electric vehicles with internal combustion engine, um, the battery electric vehicles obviously have some more, uh, let's say, wear of the road itself and of the tires because they are heavyweight, of course, due to the battery. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, they use their brakes uh, not so often because of their recuperation system, which is let's say an advantage, but actually it's giving a problem because all of a sudden you have an increased corrosion because you do not use the brakes, that's the point. Okay, um, in 2015 there was a research project started uh, named Lobrasis. Uh, it was, I think it was sponsored by Brembo that time. Um, and they, their target was actually, how can we reduce the, the uh, breakaway emissions by 50%? And their, let's say, solutions that time was, okay, we can apply a ceramic coating on the rotor and the pads, basically what we heard in the previous discussions or talks, so which can give you 60 to 90% reduction in the particulate numbers. Uh, you can, of course, apply a software which is dealing with your braking system. Um, so that's as well able to reduce 40%. And if you add a filter system, that's going to add another, or basically take out another 10 to 30%. And if we would be applying everything, we actually pick up some particulates, um, which obviously doesn't matter, uh, doesn't uh, uh, work. But anyhow, okay, what do they suggest? Um, of course, for EVs, you have the recuperation braking system. You can apply a specific software and filter systems. But nevertheless, you know, the main finding is you have to apply a ceramic coating. And that's what we learned just uh, before. So, of course, we can go either to fully carbon ceramics, okay, and we avoid cast iron at all, but that's obviously super expensive. If we go for those coating processes, I would estimate it's still, it's less expensive than a fully carbon uh, brake disc, but anyhow, it's still quite expensive. And of course, the easiest would be just to apply ferritic nitrocarburizing on standard rotors as it is. And what you see right here in this picture, this is an FNC rotor, which is post-oxidized. That's why it has this nice color. Okay, it's not new. Patented in 2009, I think, and uh, presented in 2011 already, so every one of you obviously knows it, that GM uh, is applying FNC on their cast rotors, and it improves their corrosion resistance, uh, improves brake lining wear, and so on. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, what I found basically somewhere in the internet is that by applying this 
the ferritic nitro carburizing GM was able to reduce their warranty claims on brakes by over 70%. Obviously, someone from GM would have to verify this thing. Okay, the benefit is a better performance, higher durability, you have an enhanced corrosion resistance. It's not yet super, but it's something. Yeah, you have brake dust reduction, you have an increased service life, reduced pulsation, increased pet life, and yet something else. If you are running your car, let's say, in the winter time, you have wet conditions, you have salt on the street, and then you just park it, let's say, in front of your house, and you, uh, you put the brakes on, okay, basically, stationary. I don't know how it's named, uh, a parking brake, okay? Excuse me, and then you leave it there for several days, okay? Then it's gonna stick, because it's simply corroding, and that's something you can see right here. This is a corroded cast and there the pad was sticking and this is an FNC rotor and basically it was not sticking. Okay, what is now the technology? Ferritic nitrocarburizing, I have to watch my time. Okay, ferritic nitrocarburizing, typically we use it for carbon steels, okay, and low alloy steels, but we as well have some application where we apply it on hot work steels for, for example, extrusion dies and some other parts. Um, what you see right here, this is the iron nitrogen phase diagram. Okay, and the process stays in this, uh, let's say, blue section, which is underneath AC1. So we are not yet transforming the material, we stay in the ferritic state. So, and uh, while nitriding is somehow between 500 and 590, as indicated here, the FNC starts slightly higher. So typically, we start an FNC process at 560 or 1040 Fahrenheit. Um, this is how the layer looks like, let's say from top to bottom. Uh, this is actually, this is this um, so-called compound layer because it's more or less uh, already something like a ceramic. Yeah, if you like, you have iron nitrides basically here. Underneath this section, you have a diffusion layer. So depending on the material and the composition of the material, you might have some uh, alloy nitride precipitations, which is actually bringing up your hardness of this thing. The interesting part is um, definitely for an FNC or for a nitriding process that you do not have a phase transformation, and that's why actually your hardness or the increase of the hardness doesn't come from a transformation back like you would have it in, in carburizing, where you basically go up to austenite and then you go down to, a, you quench it down to a martin side, because this thing definitely doesn't survive high temperatures, okay, the hardness, and that's different if you go with a nitriding process. Okay, uh, to give you an idea how it looks like, so that would be typically what we do on an FNC process. So you, we are aiming for this compound layer. We are not so much interested, let's say, on the diffusion layer underneath, except to avoid what we call an eggshell effect. You know, if you have something very hard on top of something which is super soft, and you, you apply some pressure, then the hard thing will just crack, okay? And therefore, you have some support, let's say, underneath. And the other picture underneath, is uh, really, that's a deep case diffusion. It's actually not so deep, but it looks deep, okay? Um, so this is rather for, let's say, if we would be treating gears or something, okay, where we really like to have a case steps. Okay, um, another nice picture. So now if we would like to enhance the corrosion resistance, we basically apply on top of this uh, compound layer or iron nitride layer, we put some iron oxides, and that's what you see here. That's the substrate. This is actually the compound layer, and there you see those speckles. This is magnetite. So that's what we are aiming for. And uh, again, let's say what is the, the properties of this thing. We have a ceramic-like surface, obviously. We can come up to, uh, let's say, 30 microns in a, in a, let's say, decent time. Of course, uh, you have a high hardness, it's 800 vicos roundabout, or even more. We have a better pitting resistance for the diffusion zone if we would be aiming for it. 
of course, improved fatigue life, same thing, but the compound layer is giving you a high chemical resistivity and a low coefficient of friction, whereas you're going to see it's not so super low, but anyhow. Okay, and you have an improved heat resistivity, and that's the funny thing, because we actually run the process at 580 degrees, and then, you know, later on, if you use the brake, if you go up to 800, uh, 580 degrees, you won't lose any, any of the properties. Okay, um, now, of course, we need to apply a stress relief before we do the FNC. Why? Simply because you have, in your castings, you have uh, casting stresses, and if I heat this thing up, basically your casting is gonna bend. Yeah, and then as we do the same thing in FNC afterwards, obviously we would bend this thing in a machined, uh, let's say, condition. Um, yeah, not a good idea. So that's why actually we heat it up prior to FNC to a temperature that is at least 30 centigrades or 55 F above the nitriding, nitrocarburizing temperature. Jumping through. Okay, that's how it looks like. So basically, that's the casting. That's the casting after stress release, then final machined, and then we put it in an oven, and basically it comes out uh, like this. So let's see what we, what we found. Um, number one, you can observe here, or no, so here, that the, there is some diffusion layer underneath, because you see that the substrate itself, if we measure with one kilogram load, you see that the hardness is approximately double of a, of a standard gray cast iron, okay? Um, the next thing is, of course, this is the FNC surface. That's a post-oxidized surface, and that's what we call a super ONC. That's as well an in furnace process, but slightly different to the ONC. So that's the three variants you see, and you see uh, that this here, that's the oxide layer this black thing in these two samples. Okay, um, in terms of roughness, okay, the roughness is slightly higher than for the gray cast iron, what you see in this, in this uh, yellow box here. Okay, um, these are hardness profiles, you know, after, let's say, various uh, uh, different uh, times, basically, on stage. Okay, um, we did some pin on disk square testing. As you can see, we, uh, we put a load of 20 Newton, uh, 500 rounds per minute, linear speed of 250 millimeters per second. Whatsoever, forget it, it's 15,000 cycles. The interesting thing is it's a six millimeter alumina ball, which is actually pressing on the surface, and the contact, contact stress calculates basically to 1.37 gigapascal. Honestly, I have no idea how this, let's say, would be converted to a real breaking situation, or a pet, basically. Okay, but you see that's the, the wear track, excuse me, that's the wear track here. Um, okay, and you see uh, the wear rate. Um, it's obviously less than with the cast iron, but it's not so super different, okay? Um, I switched it off, so let's go to this thing. Again, continuing with the pin on the square testing, what you see right here, this is the coefficient of friction. So actually the gray cast iron was very stable, but the other guys went up slightly in, uh, in the friction and then stabilized actually, talking about 15,000 cycles. Um, okay, and then we basically put it in a salt spray chamber, so the regular ASTM B117 test. It does not really convert actually to the pictures I have seen from rotors that have been exposed somehow. Um, what you see again from left to right, this is the, the gray cast iron rotor untreated. It's an FNC rotor. It's a post oxidized rotor and this is the super post oxidized, let's name it, rotor. And you see that the gray cast iron and the FNC rotor as well. Somehow they are heavily corroded after 68 hours already, okay? And now if we go with a post-oxidation, you see the first spots somehow at 100 hours or after 100 hours, 
And with the super buoyancy at 140 hours, and the last picture actually is after 360 hours. So if we compare this, for example, to, um, to an article from Delphi, um, we were trying to put it kind of in the same, in the same uh, time distance. Okay. So you see the untreated and the painted rotors obviously corrode after whatever, 60 hours or oh, 24 hours. I need to wear my glasses. I cannot really see it, but anyhow, let's say if you look at the super oil seed specimens and the knees here, you can see that yeah, after 144 hours, we see basically the first the first spots, okay, and then of course after 312 hours in this example, they are as well already quite corroded, not as bad as the ones above, but we are still working on the process and we are improving. Five. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to production. How do we do it? Basically, you see here, that's kind of a potpourri of some uh, machines we delivered. Okay, that's charge cars, two charge cars on one line. That's a transverse line. This is the, uh, basically the stationary magazine for the, for the loads, okay, with, uh, with a load indication or basically a load detection with laser. And this is the line, okay? So you see on the left-hand side, it's the FNC part, and on the right-hand side is the stress relief, yeah? The parts are actually feed from, the, from underneath here. Uh, you have two cars on each of those tracks. You have a transverse line just in case one of the cars is actually breaking down. You have a full redundancy, that's the whole idea of the system. Uh, and you have several multi-chamber furnaces. This is for FNC, this is for stress release. And if we have a look on the furnace, that's how it looks like. So actually what you see here is a load, which in that case is actually coming out of the furnace. But anyhow, it's too bad. So that's the load, okay, that's a charge car. And this is the multi-chambers, one after the other. And you see it's five seal chambers, let's say, uh, first one to heat it up, then we have a first stage FNC or stress release, a second stage, and then we go to the post-oxidation, respectively to a third uh, stage for stress relief, and then obviously cooling. And that's a little bit tricky because what we observed is actually that, especially the cooling after stress release is a very important point because otherwise you start immediately again uh, inducing some stresses. Okay, that's why we have to cool it super slowly. Okay, um, that's the way through this cell. The rotors are delivered here from the customer. Basically, you have uh, robots putting it on, 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 the, yeah, on the loads, basically in the baskets, if you like. Then they're going to be picked up by a car, basically pushed into a furnace, and then they just go through. Let's say a stroke time would be, let's say, three hours as an idea. Okay. And at the end, obviously, they come out and then the rotors will again unpack it and basically send it back to production. Um, a few impressions, let's say, from the control system. Yeah. It's a fully automated cell, of course, um, and that's the performance. So a load, we can, we can handle loads up to three metric tons. Um, obviously, this thing is working 24-7. And if we assume 350 operating days and availability of 90%, so basically we cut down another 10%, and an average weight of the rotors, let's say, has cast 26 pounds and as machined with 20 pounds, we can actually run between 750,000 and 1 million rotors, stress release, and FNC fully automated with almost no operators. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for staying with me.